All right, welcome back, everybody. Next up is our invited talk at the Crypto and Privacy Village this year. Please welcome Harlow Holmes discussing tip lines today. Thank you so much. Hi. How's it going? Um, all right. So uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk uh, entitled Tip Lines Today. I run an operating system called Cubes. This is why this looks so horrible. Um, but I think, yes, Cubes Life. Um, you, I, I think you'll bear with me. Okay, so uh, I'm, uh, by way of introduction, my name is Harlow. Uh, I am the Director of Digital Security at uh, an organization called Freedom of the Press Foundation, of which we have several friends uh, at uh, DEF CON. Um, and what we are is we're an organization that was founded in 2012. Uh, and uh, one of the ways to describe what we do is that we provide 21st century support to 21st century journalism. Uh, there's a lot of people actually at this conference who do similar things. Uh, so my department, or Freedom of the Press Foundation is kind of like based off of, an, or at least in my um, estimation, based off of like three main pillars. Uh, the one is my department digital security training, consulting, and um, uh, and other support for journalists themselves. So putting tools in journalists' hands in order to enable them to communicate with their sources and with the public at large more securely. Uh, but tools, and so this talk is going to be focused on tools. However, um, I do want to um, like underscore the importance of the other two pillars. One being our um, tech team, our amazing uh, engineering team, based out of, well, actually, I can't even say where we're based out of anymore. But um, one of our flagship products is uh, something called SecureDrop, which is a, an appliance that, are, that is installed in a number of newsrooms across the globe that leverages, uh, among other things, Tor hidden services in order to facilitate, technically speaking, uh, anonymous communication between t potential sources and the newsrooms. And actually, if you have any questions about SecureDrop, we have our lead developer and one of our secure and our um, uh, director of uh, security on that actually in the audience. So please do seek us out if you have any questions. It's a fabulous project, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but so we have education and consulting, we have tools and engineering, but we wouldn't be anywhere without the third pillar, which is their, our advocacy. So um, we have uh, this is uh, you know kind of. Uh, the Press Freedom Tracker, which is um, one of the uh, <laughs> projects by our advocacy team, where we actually have reporters who document uh, uh, attacks against uh, members of the press as they happen and report on them as, you know, like uh, reporters do. Uh, one of the uh, benefits to this tool is that one, you know, we actually have like a quantitative measure about how journalists have been attacked, where, when, you know, like what um, tools were in play when that happened. So we actually have a number of data points in order to analyze these things. We'll get back to that. Um, and also because it's advocacy, we put this out in the public light we actually have readers um, and, you know, page views and all that stuff. And thankfully, you know, through the work of our intrepid journalists, we're actually able to, like, you know, promote infractions on press freedom in, uh, to the public eye. So we're nowhere be without all of those three things, and they all interlock, and it's important. Um, so on the menu today, what we're going to do is we're just going to we're going to talk about like you know some terms, both technical and legal, uh, regarding source communications and technologies in play to do that. We're going to define those terms. We're going to uh, dive into the history of source communications, and then we're going to talk about like you know the tools in play, the standard tools, discuss the technical challenges regarding them. So like there's always, you know, the devil is in the details, as they say, um, discuss the legal challenges that, uh, you know, come up when people are using these things, because I want you to remember that no matter how great a tool is, and no matter how elegantly we can all collectively define what these terms mean, and no matter how elegantly the crypto is implemented, there's always room for error, especially when the law um, comes into play. And then we're going to talk about what we're going to do in the future. And uh, this would be like, I guess, an appeal to any of you, whether you are journalists, whether you are technologists, whether you're writing tools, using tools, um, in order to make this a little bit of a better landscape. All right. So 
Uh, in my trainings, we always do this. Uh, we talk about how to, you know, like do a threat model or whatever. Threat modeling, these are, this is a methodology by which you ask yourself a couple of questions, um, and you think about your relationship to devices and the things that you have in your hands in order to better assess exactly how best to use them. So the typical jargon is what are your assets? What are, what is it that you have to protect? Whether this is like some passwords or, your contact list that might be linked to your iCloud or like, you know, whatever. Adversary from whom? A lot of people think that their adversary is a three-letter agency or four-letter agency. Um, but, you know, sometimes that adversary is actually, you know, a troll on the internet or, you know, uh, somebody who's like incredibly bored. Um, consequences, obvious. Uh, the likelihood is actually a huge question. Um, because you have to ask yourself not only like what the likelihood that that's going to happen, what is the likelihood that like, you know, the NSA is going to be interested in your call logs or uh, when maybe the likelihood is actually that you're going to get your, you know, number sim jacked by like some kid um, who just has a, a like a grudge. Um, and then finally, we challenge people to use the tools in our trainings in order to like uh, bolster their ability to protect threats. And ultimately, um, we focus in training a lot on, you know, what we call the low hanging fruit, meaning that, uh, like, quite frankly, um, given, you know, the likelihood scenario, uh, it's way more likely that someone will try to like, you know, get into your password because you're doing password reuse or something like that and to take over like your Twitter account than it is for someone to, you know, like uh, use a supercomputer in order to like crack some some passwords or whatever. Right. This makes sense. You've all seen uh, XKCD. OK, so uh, this audience is fairly technical, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't just go over some basic terms in about like encryption and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So content, right? What's being said. Okay. Contents of your messages. Metadata, meaning as, and this uh, uh, matches really well to journalism, uh, the who, when, where, and how attributes of how conversations happen. Um, these are uh, the, what I've learned in uh, working with a lot of journalists um, is that people are more attuned to the humanly legible um, metadata, meaning like people's handles, you know, like people's names, right? Telephone numbers, et cetera. But they're less likely to um, factor in uh, the digitally or like the more computer legible uh, metadata, including like IP addresses and, and, and things like that. Um, obviously, we have the, uh, you know, the duality of encryption in transit and encryption at rest, the stuff that stays on your machine because you might have downloaded the software programs that you run, you know, like the, the data that actually lives locally on your device versus encryption in transit, um, meaning like, you know, why like SSL works or whatever. Uh, of course, there's end-to-end -end encryption, which is the, um, I, I, I guess, like, it, it's one of the most important tools that we have here, um, which I define. You can definitely, like, ping me um, afterwards to, like, berate me about this definition here. But, like, you know, uh, making sure that in addition to encryption in transit, you're actually using the service as, or the service provider in the middle that ferries that information between parties um, to be as blind as possible in that only the uh, computer or phone in play in a, a particular conversation has the material available to decrypt and make a, a, a content legible. Although there's still the metadata question and we can get into that later. Um, there's also some stuff that uh, like, you know, uh, kind of cribbed from like the old days of uh, like the cypherpunks and OTR and things like that, uh, like perfect forward secrecy, the facts or um, the ability for a piece of software in play to actually like cryptographically um, um, attest that only, you know, like a certain subset of information will be available at any given time and uh, like yeah, uh, historical things are uh, not available uh, because those keys are not available. Um, and so obviously the difference between like Snapchat's disappearing messages and something that we have in Signal. Uh, and plausible deniability, which is like cryptographically speaking, um, uh, the property that would, um, that makes it uh, certain that uh, attribution to any particular like parties of a conversation is not uh, or would take a lot more in order to deduce. 
but of course that like kind of falls down when um, you know like uh, users are tied to certain immutable properties such as phone numbers and things like that. Okay, I'm like I'm gonna blaze through this. Nobody needs to see this, but just so we're all on the same page. Encryption, communicating with that encryption, everyone can see it. All of these things when we uh, introduce these things, we like to call them the adversaries, the people with visibility onto a network who can see and modify anything that's going on, which includes you know like the board Wi-Fi uh, or sorry the board like IT department who like you know sees that you're on. I don't know, uh, whatever, Facebook, um, your internet service provider, which, you know, like is given the full um, opportunity in order to like, you know, put ads on top of uh, your uh, internet uses based off of the fact that you're like visiting certain sites, unlawful interception, the hackers in the room, um, and lawful interception, obviously, when, you know, like a court order is served in order for somebody to like uh, tap uh, your connectivity or sit outside of your house with a van. Uh, obviously, communication with uh, uh, encryption in play. So, like, you know, all of these parties, these adversaries still do have visibility onto the network, but they're not allowed to change things. They can only see exactly like what you're communicating with. The website or, you know, like service provider in the middle, of course, has 100% uh, visibility into. Uh, not only like, you know, who's communicating to whom, but also what's being said. And that's why ads work so well. Um, and then end-to-end -end encryption, where you're using the service provider once again as that blind person uh, or service in the middle that just ferries blobs of data. Okay, so now that that's over, uh, let's just talk about how this is in play uh, nowadays. So for instance, you might have noticed that a number of newsrooms have started to um, uh, publish uh, uh, pages where they advise potential whistleblowers, potential sources, interested parties uh, to um, send them stuff. Uh, just about every newsroom nowadays does have, or, um, you know, to, uh, of a certain size, has a landing page that instructs people not only how to use things like Secure Drop, but also, as I'm sure you've noticed, um, how to reach people via, like, let's say, Signal, WhatsApp, both of which are end-to-end -end encrypted methods of communication, uh, but also, like, require the use of phone numbers. And so that is excellent, and uh, it's actually, like, you know, kind of a landslide in terms of... Um, uh, the ability for these newsrooms to provide, uh, you know, a certain amount of confidentiality with any of these sources, but it is very, very far from perfect, and there is a lot of asymmetry in terms of how those are being used. Um, also, on, you know, such pages, uh, obviously, you know, people have standard email uh, um, addresses that people send to, but we're going to walk through, like, you know, kind of the asymmetry of that and why that falls down. So, Let's talk about email really quickly. Email sucks. Everyone knows that. Uh, obviously, this is from uh, the, the uh, Snowden leaks of 2013, where it was revealed that uh, the NSA, among any other uh, nation state uh, actors, could, you know, like entirely undermine uh, the encryption that takes place between uh, any, you know, like email, uh, sorry, uh, the, the undermine the encryption uh, between parties in an email conversation. This is like old news. This is six years old news. Um, we also know that uh, services like Yahoo pretty much had like a secret, uh, you know, like a development team that was maintaining a backdoor into any Yahoo account email uh, email account that was actually not known to the main security and development team there. They didn't know that. They didn't know that there was like a secret cell within Yahoo that was just dedicated to do this, maintain this backdoor. Um, we also know that like very, very recently, similar issues had been discovered in uh, Microsoft properties like like Hotmail and who's using Hotmail still. Um, not only did this reveal uh, uh, or give access to standard metadata regarding parties that were emailing one another, but actually also like uh, on certain um, certain classifications of Hotmail accounts, people had full access to the contents of those inboxes. So, you know, like 
email sucks. Um, recently, obviously, uh, there <laughs> have been attacks on DNS servers, you know, just on like, you know, the basic like uh, phone book of the internet, which perhaps in the future might be considered a war crime to tamper with um, the phone book of the internet. But currently, like the state of things are that um, these uh, uh, these systems are incredibly fragile and have been, uh, uh, vulnerabilities have been uh, leveraged increasingly and uh, in ways that often like, you know, I mean, just undermine the entire venture. Okay, so of course, what you want to do is you want to shoehorn encryption, end-to-end -end encryption into uh, the email chain. Um, however, it's incredibly error-prone, and the current options out there are like, you know, they're really, really lacking. So obviously, um, your go-to for shoehorning end-to-end -end encryption into email is by using PGP um, with your preferred GPG client of, co uh, of choice. Uh, yeah, so... Um, this is what people do. It takes, first off, if, you know, who's here using PGP? Love it? Yeah, it's great. Okay. But, like, you, you might know that, like, you know, it, you have to love it in order to stick with it because the nuances make it very, very difficult to actually use it in a secure way. Um, obviously, because you're still dealing with email, um, it, doesn't squat, uh, it doesn't quash the metadata question at all. So, of course, you know, your service providers still know who's communicating with whom. No matter how many, like, burner accounts you have, you still have an IP address, obviously. Um, and unless you're taking measures in order to obfuscate or, there, or, you know, like somehow change your IP address. Like you're not fooling anybody about who you are when you email. Um, and so that means that like while, you know, a lot of journalists have the benefit of sitting with security professionals in order to get training and to answer any questions about how to use PGP securely, sources do not. They absolutely do not. And so they're absolutely prone to hurt themselves. And of course, there is no perfect forward secrecy. I mean, so back in, you know, the day, um, obviously, like the, okay, what's, what's the key length um, for your PGP key? Anybody? Just shout. Great, 4096, cool. Like back in the 90s, it was like 128. Um, and though these, these are crackable. Like, you know, there are CTFs that we're all in undoubtedly playing right now where that's like a challenge. Um, so in the future, like, you know, you can't expect uh, your key not to be cracked and for all your secrets to be like spilled open. And of course, we do know from the Snowden revelations um, and other Versus that like, you know, like there's just email that's being hoarded with the eventuality that those will be cracked. So whatever. Um, so people, uh, that's it. People still want to do it. And people are, you know, like switching to ProtonMail, which is an admirable product. I really, really do enjoy ProtonMail. I think that they have like a lot of excellent uh, um, extra um, tools in addition to just like offering, you know, like PGP encryption proton mail users like right out of the bat but there are still some you know problems one um one thing that i've seen that i find uh, particularly alarming is just like a little bit of like uh bad messaging around what proton mail can and cannot do uh one meaning that like you know you get a proton mail account and automatically like your email is end to end encrypted which is absolutely not true because obviously um if uh, like between ProtonMail users, yes, that works by default, but also because it's web-based and because um, uh, ProtonMail doesn't, or uh, so I believe, ProtonMail does not want to assume that anyone's particular browser is capable of like actually, you know, like performing calculations on larger keys. You get a two, uh, like a, a 2048 bit key by default, unless you like, you know, um, opt to to level up a little bit. So that's one off um, bad messaging that needs to be kind of addressed. Also the fact that like, you know, unless you're emailing a ProtonMail user, that's not going to kick in unless you actually dig deeper into the settings and configure um, the ProtonMail from its web interface to work with PGP using, you know, like keys, um, public keys from other people that you want to contact on other uh, email clients um, that you use via like the standard PGP um, key server <laughs> morass, which sucks. Uh, and so like there's a lot of um, 
uh, bad messaging once again regarding how to safely use this. And you might find yourself in a situation where you're noticing that like a lot of people are just spinning up ProtonMail accounts um, and emailing people in the clear to, you know, a news orgs like, you know, like, I don't know, like Microsoft, hypothetically, Microsoft Outlook backed uh, email address, thinking that that is a secure um, method of communication where it's not. So there's bad messaging going on. Uh, a lot of people are using Mailvelope. Mailvelope, um, I'm sorry, these slides are a little bit out of date because Mailvelope actually got a huge facelift in recent days. Um, it looks great. It's lovely. Uh, so it looks better than this. But Mailvelope is actually the, the current like go-to for um, uh, people who are still uh, like wedded to using um, browser-based email email clients, including like, you know, anyone who has like a Google Enterprise account or even like using Outlook um, for web or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's cool to be secure. That's how it looks. Um, it would, uh, it uh, gives you a pop-up window where you can compose a message without, hopefully, <laughs> without, um, you know, having that uh, that message saved to a draft folder, which is great, um, and then pops that into the standard uh, composer window in, in you know, your client of choice. Um, there's also, uh, this is great, but there's also like a lot to, um, uh, a lot to worry about, and actually I have a slide about that a little bit later, so I'll get back to it. Um, then there's also Tutanota. Uh, Tutanota is also an admirable client uh, that provides end-to-end -end encryption for, um, uh, you know, like email parties, uh, but it still actually has like its pain points. Um, that's at, well, one notably was um, the attack on Tutanota users that leveraged the fact that um, the domain Tutanota.com, which is legitimate, uh, that's legitimate. Uh, however, a nation state attacker spun up a, a, a server at that looked exactly like Tutanota um, at Tutanota.com. Org, which given the communities that we work with, primarily, you know, like potential whistleblowers, human rights defenders, et cetera, um, they're definitely like attuned to trust a dot org way more than they would trust anything else. And so this was actually a really like horrifying and effective way of like luring a bunch of vulnerable people in vulnerable populations to a site where they just added their, you know, like username and passphrases to open up their Tutanota accounts. So um, the fact that like, you know, they're like, despite all of our best, uh, uh, our best attempts, uh, like the fact that nobody went up like DNS twist in order to like, just kind of recognize like where those vulnerabilities are, that is going to increase, those attacks like that are going to increase. Um, one thing about Tutanota actually is that uh, they have a uh, like a nascent feature. It's in beta, but I highly recommend people like take a look at it and you know play around with it, which is called like Secure Connect, um, where you are able to spin up a subdomain, and we'll get to that in a moment, um, in order to enable like uh, anonymous submissions via the Tutanota email chain uh, from you know like potential sources or whatever. So uh, this is a, like it's an interesting project and it's still in beta, and I would love to hear from I mean not only I but also like Tutanota. Nota, I'm sure we'd love to hear from the developer community about like the the sustainability of that model. So to um, re recap, there, um, I, I guess I'll go backwards. Like Mailvelope uh, is the only like you know p uh, web based uh, like PGP client that actually like has quote unquote the ability to interface with your onboard native um, GPG client. So whether you're running like, I don't know, GPG for Win or, you know, GPG tools or, um, you know, the, the native Linux based one. However, it is dicey. It doesn't always work. And so one problem with that, that we, that I see a lot in the field is actually like people losing their keys because, you know, they have to update Firefox and like there is no backup because the, um, uh, the interface between uh, Mailvelope and your native GPG client is a little bit incomplete, has a lot of bugs in it. Um, so yeah, 
uh, and also uh, as far as like, you know, the Tutanota example goes, where once again, it's incredibly admirable that you can go to, you know, like uh, you can go to leaks.newspaper.org and then like create this um, uh, email chain. Uh, the, set, the, the very, very fact that, you know, you are going to like a subdomain and that's what's required currently by uh, Tutanota is actually like uh, really, really problematic, especially if, you know, legal gets into play. And so um, this is the first part where I want to just highlight uh, the um, discrepancies between like, you know, what's technically awesome and what's technically elegant and technically works and the way that, you know, um, someone might be uh, um, investigated by law enforcement. Thanks. Halfway. Cool. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to segue into what we teach people about how to use the tools. Uh, my apologies in advance to all of my colleagues who've seen this a million times. Okay, so this is The Matrix. Uh, where we, instead of like telling people, use this tool, use that tool, blah, 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 we actually teach people how to evaluate whatever tools they have at their disposal along a matrix because it's always going to change. And also this matrix is entirely um, subjective, meaning this is what it looks like from my perspective. And we always tell people that their mileage may vary. So on our um, Y axis vertically, we have, you know, like what's excellent uh, in terms of like of their technical ability in order to maintain a confidential conversation, i.e., do they offer end-to-end -end encryption, right? Yes, Signal definitely does. Um, and, uh, you know, like how do they treat metadata? Can we actually prove that? Or is there, you know, like a, uh, I guess, precedent out there where people, um, you know, where these attestations have been challenged and came out victorious versus stuff that sucks? Um, but then we have the, whoops, the our x-axis you know horizontally where you have to talk about availability and how appropriate a tool is given a conversation so in my world um i put signal here because i know about you know like obviously we we know we know about signal i'm not going to go into it uh, it's great um but the fact that like you know only like a handful of people in my life increasingly more use signal um makes that uh, or puts that in this quadrant here whereas whatsapp which of course has you know end to end encryption similar to signal um but the fact that it's owned by facebook um and what they're doing to the metadata and blah 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 i'm going to get like a little bit into that but not too much um uh, the fact that like up until fairly recently, you know, like all of your chats were like backed up to iCloud or, you know, Google Drive or whatever, like these are decisions that bring it down on our Y axis. But you, you know, conversely, you have to think about um, the type of conversation that you're going to have. The fact that literally like WhatsApp is on like 1.5 billion phones on the planet. That's huge in terms of accessibility. The fact that like, you know, if you're speaking to someone who, um, uh, like for various reasons, if you have something better like Signal on your phone would get them in trouble, whether that's somebody who lives in another region, someone who's in a, you know, a very, very precarious situation um, where like, you know, like uh, intimate partners might be looking at their phone for things like that. You know, these are going to color your your decisions. Uh, Facebook Messenger sucks, obviously. If you have any Facebook app on your phone, like you're just owned by Facebook, as long as people aren't using SMS messages, which for so many reasons, uh, not only like, you know, from like the, the legal, like, you know, we can just like subpoena a whole bunch of text messages, but also from um, like a hacking, uh, a hacking perspective, like it's just a bad idea. Um, we teach people about uh leveraging um you know safety numbers in order to like actually uh trust the conversations that they're having despite using signal but like a lot of people still are not doing that. Um, and so once again, I'm going to come back to the asymmetry here, but like this is not happening. Verifying safety numbers is not happening on a, on a larger scale. Uh, people don't also realize that, uh, like, the, the precarity of group messaging, meaning that, you know, like, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but, like, you can leave your own signal group, but, like, you can't eject anyone from a signal group. And so as, um, and this is, uh, like, a... Uh, 
as people's groups grow in order to like talk about sensitive projects and things like that, depending, especially for like distributed teams, this actually comes into play, um, meaning that like, you know, someone within the signal group might have been compromised, no one has any idea, and you have to you you have no choice but to like burn that group to the ground, never return to it and start up a new one minus that person who you suspect. And this is actually not an elegant solution at all. It doesn't work. Um, people are remiss to remember expiry on, um, uh, on, on group messages, especially, uh, you know, so what we do advise people to do is to like set up their, like, you know, a one week expiry as soon as they join a signal group or as soon as somebody notices it. But this is not, um, you know, like it, it's not a default, um, and it's not something people are doing. Uh, yeah for the interest of time. Also, um, so sealed senders is actually a little bit of uh, uh, a, a dicey bit. Um, so sealed senders in Signal allows for um, a little bit more um, uh, obfuscation of metadata within Signal. And that actually becomes increasingly important, but it's not perfect. But the thing about sealed senders is that while that can be enabled very, very easily for members, uh, for people that you're talking to who are in your contact list, if you're using a phone as a member of, uh, you know, like a, of the press or whatever, uh, that um, uh, you're, uh, you have to like enable it for everyone. I see a, yes. Good. Yeah. So the question was, I mean, if I'm, I'm correct, uh, how does, or does that have any effect on being on background? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So that's an interesting question and I'm going to, I'm going to spitball with that. Um, so the question was like, does, you know, enabling sealed senders, um, have any impact perhaps on, uh, the type of sourcing that you might do? So first off, I, um, uh, you might actually want to seek out, like, and get that same, or ask that same question to other journalists who, um, are, like, incredibly technically minded who are actually at this conference. So, like, Lorenzo, um, uh, or, uh, Joseph Cox or Micah, um, or whatever, in, in order to, like, talk about that. I mean, I think that that's an interesting question, uh, regarding whether or not you can take these technical properties and, like, use those to kind of enforce, you know, like, very, very soft standards within journalism. So such as like um, whether uh, a source is on background, meaning that you're when you print the article, they're like you're not necessarily going to like you know attribute um, certain information to them. They just like gave you a little bit of background, or whether they're on the record, um, and in which case you might actually like leverage. Um, uh, you might leverage uh, disappearing messages in order to do that. But the thing is like, these are soft standards. And y I mean, I can't really imagine how any of those things can be enforced technically. All right. Anywho's not going to, oh, oh, so um, another thing is like uh, SIM jacking is still a problem, meaning somebody ganking your phone number and impersonating you. And of course, if you have like uh, you know, a public presence where, uh, you're advertising your phone number to literally everyone on the war in the world that actually might be, you know, something within your threat model. So telling people to set a registration pin is super duper important. So, you know, you can't authenticate signal on another device unless you have that pin. Um, also the leakage, uh, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, uh, later, but I just want you to note that there's like all sorts of like third party or sorry, like a side channel leakages that can happen. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, like badges and things like that, being sure that like if someone, you know, like looks at your phone, even when it's locked, you don't have like this big old bubble that says like, you know, source says here's the P tape or whatever. Um, so leveraging those things to work for you uh, is really important. It makes all of the difference. We have guides um, on our website if you want to like talk about that. Um, so, but then, uh, I guess to bring it back, like there's huge privacy implications. So <laughs> once again, uh, courtesy of Dan Sinker, uh, of open news, one of my mentors, uh, don't, so people have the, um, idea nowadays because like, you know, end to end encryption as it's been enabled by all of these tools is so convenient. And so like, omnipresent that like uh, having, you know, the this type of sensitive information come to the phone that you have in your pocket um, is 
incredibly problematic. And quite frankly, um, you know, the developers of Signal did not intend or did not ever expect that it would be the case that, you know, you could conceivably get the P-tape on your phone and then call your mom and then take a lift home. Like, that's, uh, that's huge. Um, so you might have seen this, um, <laughs> Joseph uh, Cox's article about, you know, just like the ephemerality of, uh, uh, Sorry, not the ephemerality, rather, the, uh, the fact that, like, you know, our phone numbers are, you know, uh, like, so intrinsically tied to our identities, right? So, like, you have someone's phone number, you have that person in general, right? Um, but yet, this still happens. Hello. Uh, so <laughs> you uh, obviously you'll notice that like, you know, like a lot of um, uh, reporters nowadays like do have on their, their their public presences like this is the phone number come like, you know, I promise like I will pick it up at any time to talk to you. Um, but uh, counter that with a very, very thoughtful article written by Jillian York of EFF about, you know, like just like uh, how you have to factor in your uh, things, your identity, like things like your gender, your race, your, you know, like ability, your everything into like, uh, uh, doing this type of work. If you're going to use like signal as the primary or like any phone number base as your primary. And quite frankly, like, you know, like I have huge amount of respect for both of these men up here. Like I really, really do. I love them. Um, but like, you have to imagine that this type of openness is only afforded to people of a certain type. And so we need better solutions. Um, because not only like for protection, but also it definitely like affects the type of reporting someone can do. And I want you to think about that. So we go to virtual numbers. Uh, obviously, like, uh, you know, like a, a Twilio, any Twilio fans out here? Pop, pop. Yeah. They're great. It's like actually my favorite toy is Twilio. Um, <laughs> ask me about Twilio, my lord and savior. Um, so Twilio um, has, you know, allows you to spin up very, very affordable um, virtual numbers in order to link that to a signal device. There are, of course, like, you know, the caveats that you only can, well, one, you can only, you know, like on an iPhone, for instance, have one uh, phone number uh, associated with signal. On Android, however, you can have many because um, Android allows you to have user profiles. So you can spin up like X profiles, associate them with X signal numbers and toggle between them, you know, like on whatever schedule that you, you, you figure out for yourself. Um, but there are some caveats. So, and this is to prevent spam and other like, you know, types of fraud, uh, providers, uh, like WhatsApp primarily, um, WhatsApp, you still allow you to register Twilio, Twilio numbers. I have a grandfathered in WhatsApp number that I got off of Twilio. Um, but they no longer allow you to do this. And the reason why is because if you, for instance, look up any phone number, you might notice that the carrier type is registered as uh, voice over IP rather than mobile landline or whatever. Um, this actually makes a huge difference to the point where like in certain cases, you might at best receive a whole bunch of CAPTCHAs that you have to go toggle through in order to associate that number, or it just might sinkhole you and not associate your number at all, depending on your service and depending on the method by which you're trying to associate this phone number. So this is, <laughs> I went to Bletchley Park, uh, which is the, the birthplace of modern computing and cryptography and all that stuff. Um, I tried to get this phone number. I failed. I couldn't get it. Um, so, uh, a lot of, uh, people, you know, like if you are using the virtual number, usually that actually links up to like some sort of desktop situation and which is especially, uh, useful if you're, um, uh, if you have multiple uh, reporters who are working on the same story, who are receiving the same tips, this works really, really well for distributed teams. It, look, it works really, really well, but there are so many limitations and there's so many danger points. So um, first off is the logging. Um, there was um, an article that came a couple of months ago regarding 
uh, just the fact that like it on a Mac, uh, you know, like the signal or the notifications, the desktop notifications that come in through like growl or whatever, were actually also being like logged to a separate side channel, like database that was entirely like uh, accessible, especially from a forensic standpoint. So you have to think about that. Um, also, a, a conundrum within newsrooms specifically is the IT culture there. So like, yeah, you're receiving, you know, like you, you're, you have this tip line that is on your work provision desktop. And if IT can remote desktop into your computer at any time, that actually is a huge, huge detriment to how well you can maintain a confidential conversation. And so, um, I don't know how to get around this. I personally do not have like uh, the clout within any newsrooms to move that decision in one way or another. I can only just bring it up. Um, and also the same thing goes for full disk encryption. Um, obviously, we know why that's important. Uh, but there are some places where uh, full disk encryption on a, a work provision laptop is not a possibility because of like brittle IT infrastructure. Uh, so, um, some people are doing some cool stuff uh, <laughs> using uh, like a, a variety of like third party, um, usually open source developed uh, clients in order to uh, y y like better leverage signal, um, especially for desktop or whatever. Uh, some that I want to shout out is like the Signal CLI uh, by a Sam K on GitHub, uh, Fin 93's Signal D, which I like a little bit better, which I learned about. Uh, Cigarillo, um, which is being um, developed by the Guardian Project, uh, which is also another group of mentors of mine, uh, that actually is being leveraged into help desk software. Uh, you might want to have a look at that, uh, where you can um, allow people to have like a, an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation with their with their web client, which is the endpoint, and then like you know the the end in, uh, the encryption kind of drops off there because it's more like point-to-point -point encryption, but uh, it's still really really useful if you want to you know like um, mass triage. Um, and this is like excellent for incident response, as you can imagine. Um, Tuttle, uh, developed by, it's an open source project, it's super in beta, it's not ready yet, but it's really, really awesome by um, Parker Higgins within our team at Freedom of the Press Fi uh, Foundation, which actually lever uh, you know, like allows you to spin up uh, a, a, a signal tip line, we'll say, um, over a Tor hidden service, which is pretty cool. Um, how are these are the caveats? How are you managing attachments? Attachments are really, really, really hard to manage on any of these like uh, CLI clients. Um, also, uh, disappearing messages, support for that is really, really um, dicey, once again. And so you might find yourselves in conversations where like disappearing messages just like drop off and maybe people don't notice. So you're actually like creating permanent records because a lot of these C uh, CLI clients have bugs where they um, struggle to maintain the period for disappearing messages. Uh, yeah, I talked about, <laughs> you know, the fact that it's no longer end-to-end -end encrypted. It's actually rather point-to-point -point encrypted. Um, and so if you are going to be like really persnickety about like your standards for end-to-end -end encryption, that, that can be problematic to you. Um, and also it's Java. So, uh, Kind of finally. All right. So um, we have all these really, really cool tools, but uh, you have to uh, once again appreciate the difference between stuff working well in math and stuff working well for you in life. Um, so encryption, right? Bearing parallel construction, big caveat, I don't have any knowledge of any of these tools that we've been talking about that we love so much being like, you know, entirely backdoored or whatever. Um, but that said, really, like, there's so much opportunity for people to leverage, you know, any of these like side channel attacks um, in order to, you know, like pretty much get your data anyways. So this is who is, uh, yeah. okay, that's okay. Uh, um, so, like, you just get a warrant and you take someone's phone, right? Um, in the more elegant scenarios, you would get, uh, you know, your lawyer um, would be, uh, you know, like, they would have to, like, you know, enter into discovery. There would be, like, search terms that you can, like, query the phone for and get wired data 
if you have to comply with that and you know you do or in the least elegant cases and this happens a lot with like you know people on the ground so like when you know members of the press actually have their phones confiscated at an event that they're covering when human rights defenders like you know have their phones taken from them in a border crossing when you know like whatever somebody takes your phone at like it, uh, i don't know coming in through you know cpb or whatever they'll just take your phone and put it on the xerox machine and copy it copy what they say so um uh, I did want to bring up uh, that, uh, you know, like uh, uh, recently with uh, the Natalie Edwards case um, where, uh, you know, like uh, it, nothing stopped despite the fact that they were using WhatsApp or whatever, like nothing stopped um, a, a subpoena from getting what it ultimately wanted, which was the content of those messages because that resided on the phone and that was entered into discovery. Um, uh, thanks. To, uh, there's also like, you know, kind of like scarier things that keep me up at night. Um, kudos to, to Micah, who, um, uh, in his recent article, um, in Intercept, uh, about, um, you know, the way that, and actually I'm going to use a term by, um, uh, a professor at, uh, USC Annenberg, uh, Mark Ambender, uh, where, uh, we're now like at a point where within like the digital security sphere, we're, at the point where we are reverse engineering indictments, okay? Um, and so what keeps me up at night is like, you know, just like these side channel attacks, such as the fact that like, yes, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted, but the fact that Apple, you know, does have like a certain amount of unencrypted data that they have that they keep up to, you know, 30 days and totally subpoenable, such as iMessage capability query logs, which, you know, like, you Think about like uh, things like presence, things like, you know, like uh, someone is typing, like uh, things like that, that actually give off a lot of metadata that is incredibly snoopable and you don't need to undermine encryption in order to get that. So that's dark. And so um, uh, once again, uh, a phrase I like to use a lot is the asymmetry of preparedness. Uh, first off, um, don't use WhatsApp if you're covering national security. Probably want to use Signal. Probably want to use something way better than that. Probably want to do something that we're not even going to discuss in front of a camera. Um, think about the, you know, once again, think about your settings for like logging um, metadata and uh, data retention and whether or not you can actually like maintain that plausible deniability however you can. Um, for journalists, I always tell them that, you know, like, you have, you probably have good legal counsel and good for you, um, but your source is not going to. Uh, you probably like, you know, have the benefit of going through a training so you know how to like take care of that low hanging fruit. You know about full disk encryption. You know about like the matrix and like why signals great. You know all of these things, but your source does not. Um, and they're not, they're gonna fumble. Uh, so uh, in closing, let's talk about secure drop because I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, secure drop uh, is, uh, I'm gonna kind of breeze through this because I don't have time. Uh, this is the parking lot of the Watergate. What I think is really, really cool about secure drop is like, actually this slide is a little bit inaccurate because this is just going to a regular website. But when you think about like, you know, uh, using hidden services, uh, the fact that you take your three hops and the service takes its three hops to meet you in the rendezvous point, that's like kind of exactly like meeting in the parking lot and I dig it. Um, currently, uh, secure drop is a little bit cumbersome. And so we're always working on making that better. Um, it, it, and, uh, currently, like, you know, people, uh, take submissions, view them on the secure viewing station, which is tails based and air gapped. We love it. But, um, increasingly, like, uh, if you want to actually, like, work with the data that you receive, um, there's so many command line tools, but they fall down, especially because the end users, these journalists are terrified of the terminal. Uh, USB sticks, uh, off often suck and, like, break. Um, also like updating and also adding new software that's more capable to a sneaker net or sorry to an air gap system requires sneaker netting and people are not really attuned to that so it takes a lot of hand holding and most people don't do it and also you need a printer you, you need a printer and that's like ridiculous <laughs>
Um, but our, our, our team has been working on the next generation of that, which is actually based off of the Cubes operating system, which is this ugly thing that you see here. But it allows you to leverage a lot of tools like what you had mentioned, Ethan, in your talk about, you know, just uh, leveraging like a whole bunch of tools in order to actually work with and interrogate the data once it comes through. So we're really, really excited about that. Ask our folks if you have more questions. It will totally streamline this like cumbersome process down to something a lot more manageable and more fun. Um, onion share also for moving bigger um, bits of data. So one thing that I do um, encourage people to do is to think about not only using SecureDrop as like a submission platform, but also using it to um, like perhaps facilitate how and choreograph how you might get like data, especially if it's big data, um, onto your platform. So like leveraging and learning how to use tools like Onion Share uh, by Micah uh, is really really awesome. Um, there you go. Okay. Last thing, be available everywhere. Different people are going to have different comfort zones and giving them the opportunity to reach them on whatever platform they might um, be uh, competent on is the best thing that you can do. More technically speaking, one, obviously your contact page, right? You know, you're, you're using HTTPS, right? Okay. And there's like still more you can do. Ask our, our people if you have any questions. Minimize the ads and the tracking and stuff like that. Do not use subdomains because obviously leaks.news.org is really bad uh, in a subpoena. And um, also to leverage like the comments of the internet in order to mirror this information. Um, so it's, uh, you, you allow more plausible deniability in the first contact situation. Um, also, uh, no matter what you decide to do, if you're spinning up some stuff, please prepare for it either to succeed wildly, um, and so you have to um, uh, like prepare for you know like abuse and misuse and things like that. And I got to stop um, and uh, be be able to tear it down. Okay, yeah. All right. Spread the word. The floor all is right. now cool. open for I'm questions. Done. Thank you, all of these people. They're great. And goodbye. Okay. We have five minutes for questions. So if you have questions, guys, you can just, you know, peer. Um, so I saw the matrix that you had with uh, the the tile. Oh, sorry, the signal and the. Uh, messaging. So, as a crypto community, I know we hate proprietary algorithms, but how, how would you fare Telegram? Uh, oh, app like Telegram, some, some Telegram? There. Yeah. Um, so, like, officially, I really, really, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I tend to, like, have a moderate amount of faith in their claims of end to end encryption between two parties. However, this is another bad messaging problem where like there, uh, no one is, uh, people are getting deceived about like, you know, there being end to end encryption on like group chats and stuff like that. Um, so that, that, that does worry me. Yeah. Also, I have like conspiracy theories about like when they got slapped with that like $16,000 fine or whatever for having too good encryption. And I thought that that was just like theater, but that's a conspiracy theory for me. Um, yeah. But one thing that I do ap uh, appreciate about Telegram is that, um, they have a very, very rich playground to play in for developers. Uh, and so like, you know, like spinning up like proxy uh, or bots and proxies and things like that is like actually really, really interesting. So yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Yeah, so if I put Signal on my phone and I delete it, yet if, if I go to a TSA, not TSA, but some other country, that, and yeah. they're going to look at my device, it's not going to be installed, but they're going to see it's one of the devices, I mean, one of the programs I installed. Um, how is there a way, is there a way to, for me to just remove it from the cloud so they know that it's not, I never... <laughs> Okay, um, so like not really, and it also depends on your platform. So if you are like, let's say uh, you have iCloud connected to uh, your iPhone, um, that is definitely information that is in your iCloud. And like you might notice like if ever you get a new phone, it's like download the apps that you've already really loved, you know, so there's that. And the same thing for Android. Um, and so uh, the, if you want to, uh, I guess, like have less linkability than the easiest thing to do would just to be to log out any of any of those services and it depends on how far you're willing to go in order to maintain that uh unlinkability Great. thanks hello hi so um i guess my question is related to it departments in news organizations and maybe helping them to help us so to speak and help journalists be 
uh, a bit more anonymous or, or help their, keep their sources anonymous, that is. So, you know, large, new, large newsrooms will probably won't have IT departments that are very flexible and very small newsrooms will probably be extremely flexible, but like have, is there any consideration of maybe working on training materials to help medium-sized news or uh, IT departments that use management tools and maybe find ways to configure their management tools to be a little bit less surveillance-y? Uh, yeah, and that would be actually a really, really great project. Um, I think that, or at least from my perspective, one thing that I haven't had the bandwidth to do yet is to um, focus m less, I guess, on like, you know, journalists as end users and focus more on like the infrastructure that supports them from an IT perspective. And yeah, all of those things definitely need to be done. Um, I think it would be really, really like groundbreaking to see some kind of programming that addresses, you know, the IT needs of a news department that interfaces with potential whistleblowers. That would be groundbreaking. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you.